You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and today I welcome back one of my favorite guests, Dr. Leonard Casuto. A professor of English at Fordham University, you know him as the author of the Graduate Advisor column for the Chronicles of Higher Education and books like The Graduate School Mess and with Robert Wise's book, The New PhD, How to Build a Better Graduate Education. He's here today to chat with me about his newest work, Academic Writing as If Readers Matter. Lynn, welcome back to the show. Heather, it's always great to be here. Why don't we start? by you sharing with the audience why you wrote this book. Well, I'm a reader of academic writing just like anybody else. Uh, And by academic writing, I mean any writing that's written with some kind of seriousness of purpose, but especially the kind of writing that is written with seriousness of purpose within some kind of college or university setting. So I, I read a lot of this because I need to for my job and Also, plenty of it interests me, and uh, too much of it is too damned hard to read. Just really a slog. And I will couple that observation with the fact that, unlike many people, I teach in the college and university setting, and so I am in charge of um, producing a lot of of this work through my, not only myself, but also my students. That is, I'm in the, uh, I'm in the factory. I, I work in the factory and I not only produce myself, but I also work to help other people produce this work. And I have been doing this for decades now. And I, I want to see this factory work better. Too much academic writing is too hard to read. And it's not just a matter of it being hard to read. When academic writing doesn't succeed in communicating, and we'll talk a little bit more about communication, I'm sure, then it isn't simply a problem for the individual writer of that individual piece of work. It's a problem for everybody. It's a problem for the academic sector for colleges and universities generally, because whenever somebody produces a piece of academic writing, they're doing it not only in their own name, but also in the name of the enterprise. And also it's a problem for society at large because the relationship between higher education and the larger society needs to be healthy for both members of that relationship to help each other. And right now, that relationship is not healthy, and bad writing is part of the reason. It isn't all of the reason. I want to be very clear about that, but it's a part of the reason. And if we can fix that, we can take at least a step in the right direction. You use an extended metaphor throughout the book of taking your reader along for a ride, that this is a journey that as you're writing, you should be considering someone's here with you. And you talked about reading work that feels like a slog. And I have to say, being in a similar position, the journey that people bring me on is often very bumpy. Sometimes it's scary. Sometimes I have no idea where we're going. Could you start by sharing with the audience how they can start thinking about their writing as a journey with two people and not just themselves? Let's get to that communication idea, first of all, then that writing of any kind needs to communicate. And if this this sounds like a truism, bear with me, because too much academic writing doesn't communicate. It, It contains information, but if you put information out there and nobody receives it, then communication didn't happen. Some kind of declamation happened but if nobody hears it or if nobody hears what's what's important or necessary about it 
then that's not communication. Communication is a circuit, a circuit where the writer is extending himself or herself and the reader is receiving something that at the end of that extended hand. I, I use the metaphor of a journey, yes, and I really like that metaphor. Another metaphor I rely on in the book is the idea of the clasp of a hand, that the writer is extending their hand, and the, if the reader clasps that hand, then some kind of connection is being achieved. But if, if the writer extends the hand or, or refuses to, and the reader is, the reader's hand is waving out in the air, well, nothing happens that is valuable then. The, it's possible that the writer wrote a book, but if that book hasn't communicated its message to the audience for whom it's intended, then what did happen is something quite wasteful, or even in its own small way, tragic, because a lot of time and effort is for naught. So I'm trying to promote communication here. The metaphor of the journey and the metaphor of the clasp of the hand are this, are, are in this sense, the same thing that the writer and the, the writer needs to show an awareness that we're doing it for a reader. And if we try to understand what that reader's needs are, then we are most likely going to do a better, more thoughtful job. And then more knowledge will get out into the world and the world will be a better place. So you really take this idea of communication, which I think everyone would agree with. Yes, of course. Of course, Heather and Lynn, I write my ideas down to communicate them to the world. But you challenged at least me in your writing to say, ah, or to ask rather, but are you writing to connect? Are you writing to connect? And you bring up this idea of everything we do is a story. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about writing as storytelling and the power of a story. Well, we are, as human beings, we are storytelling animals. Stories are how we communicate since time immemorial, since before we figured out how to write. Stories were how we carried our information forward. That uh, some of the oldest pieces of written literature started out as oral communication, that they were stories that were passed down through generations, through centuries in some cases. So this, this idea that story is our primary tool for communicating, we need to understand that we're always telling stories. And if we do understand that, if we can understand a piece of writing as a story, that in our, every argument is a story and every story is an argument. Uh, for example, uh, I'm going to be giving a talk on freak shows in a couple of days. And uh, freak shows are a lamentable uh, American entertainment, not just American. Uh, people with anomalous bodies have been displayed for fun and profit for many centuries. Uh, they're part of, it's part of, hu of human history that we've been doing this. For example, hirsutism, that is excessive hair on the body. People with hirsutism have been displayed as freaks for untold centuries. And they would be, um, the, uh, uh, oh, it's, uh, it's the lion boy. It's, uh, you know, Larry the lion boy. Um, and, uh, the reason that Larry the lion boy got that way is because his mother, she, she spent too much time looking at pictures of lions in, uh, in books and she was entra entranced by them when she was pregnant. This idea, which had a lot of currency at one time, we now call the theory of maternal impression. But centuries before this was, um, was debunked, this was a way that people understood how this birth anomaly could happen. It was, it's a story that explains something. Another way to explain it is you imagine a doctor on stage saying, here are the causes of congenital hirsutism, that is excessive hair. This is a medicalization where the, me the medical profession says, okay, this is not some kind of 
wonder known only to God. This is some kind of, of uh, congenital formation that has some kind of genetic explanation. Those are two different stories to explain the same phenomenon. It's the idea that we communicate information by story. If we understand arguments as stories, then we can understand better that the reader wants to hear a story and is more likely to have that story stick than if the information is presented in some kind of uh, rote uh, recitation of detail, as you might find in an encyclopedia article. And the reason that encyclopedias are tend to be boring to read is because there isn't a whole lot of attentiveness to story in them. So one of the messages of this book is understand the story you're telling and understand how the reader might hear it. There are different ways to tell a story. If you're writing something for uh, an academic audience, that is, if you imagine researchers are going to read it, it's, it makes sense. And this is something that I suggest in the book to start with your main points because your reader wants to know, should I read deeply into this or not? Because academic readers are often reading for use as part of their jobs. So let them know if this is going to help them do their jobs. You said so many things there. Where do I start? Um, I'm going to start with where you just ended, which was let the reader know right up front what your main points are. But often I will read a version, and I'm going to guess it's a very early version of what you call maybe an upside down paragraph where the student is writing to understand what they think. And then they turn that in versus writing to understand what they think and then starting the writing project. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the value of revision and how thinking translates into writing and why this may be something that people struggle with because they think, well, if I'm putting pen to paper, I'm writing. But when it comes to academic writing and articulating an argument, probably going to take a number of times of putting that pen to paper. Well, there's an old saw in the writing world, and I'm not just talking about the academic writing world, but the writing world generally. Uh, you just gave half of it. I write in order to find out what I think. And then the second part of that is, and then I begin. So writing in order to figure out what your idea is, is a great idea because writing is thinking. Writing is not simply a matter of transcribing the thoughts that you've already arrived at. Writing is a thought process. It's a different thought process than talking. And it's certainly a different thought process from, say, reading, reading, uh, you know, three pages of a book and then sitting back and saying, Hmm, what's, what's going on there? and reflecting. Those are all valuable processes. Those three that I just described, where you sitting, sitting back and reflecting, talking and writing, but they're not the same thing. They are all three examples of thinking and writing is the most rigorous of them, the most disciplined. So if you're engaged in a piece of writing, well, there's a, there's another old, old adage. There is no good writing, only good rewriting. And I thought I knew at one point who said that and it was credited to Oliver Wendell Holmes as, uh, when I, as I first received it. But when I actually tried to look up and see if that's true, in fact, nobody knows who said that, which means that a lot of people have said it, which means it's probably good advice. And I endorse it strongly myself. Now, uh, I suggested that th this idea of an upside down paragraph where you write your way to your main idea. It's not always the worst idea. It's just that if you're doing academic writing, it's usually not a good idea. Most academic writing works best if you front load the argument because the reader is in a position of wanting to know, is this going to be worth my time? Because a lot of the readers of academic writing are working. They, uh, maybe I'm planning to, to teach a class on freak shows. So I'm going to be reading about freak shows and I want to find out what are some of the main arguments about them. And, uh, and I'm going to see if, you know, is this an argument I've seen before or not? I want to know. And I want to know sooner rather than later so that I can see whether I 
I need to pay close attention to this one out of the 20 articles that I've, that I've downloaded. So, uh, academic readers benefit from knowing something pretty clear up front about what's going on here because academic readers are often working as opposed to pleasure readers who are not. Or in a more whimsical turn, the, uh, I, you know, I like, I like whimsical metaphors and I, and I use plenty of them in this new book. I hope that that makes it fun. One of those whimsical metaphors is uh, that I'm, I'm asking you as the reader to understand the academic reader, somebody who is reading for use as a blue whale. Uh, and blue whale is a baleen whale, which is to say a whale of, that has a, um, a certain kind of, of sieve in its mouth, a sheet of strips of baleen, which is made of the same substance that our fingernails are made out of. And uh, baleen whales, like the blue whale, take giant gulps of water and then force the water through these strips of baleen, which act like a strainer, and send the water back out and capture the food, which in the case of a blue whale is krill, a, um, a, a small organism in the ocean. And blue whales go through their day taking one giant gulp of water after another, forcing it through the baleen and eating tons, literally tons and tons of krill. So um, lots of academic readers behave this way, that you're taking giant gulps of information, you're sifting and straining it because you want to see what it is that you need to keep for your own work, whether it's what you're writing, whether what's what you're teaching, the presentation you may be giving at work the next day. Reading, reading can be a form of work and there's nothing wrong with that. And if you understand that the writing that you're doing is likely to be read as part of somebody's job, it doesn't mean that they can't get some pleasure out of it while they're doing it. But if the writer understands that this is what the reader is doing, then the writer can behave accordingly and produce a piece of writing that is more likely to communicate successfully, to create that circuit, that clasp of two hands. So many good things. Where do I want to go next? I'd like to share my experience of getting your book. Please. Because it was truly a somatic experience. It means a lot to me how it feels when I hold a book. So the feel of the cover, the look of the cover, when I slip through the pages to see figures, to see call-out boxes, to see that you took the time to bold the areas where, as a reader, I knew that's where I was going to pay attention. And I was, I was looking forward to reading this book because I am constantly giving feedback about writing, and I'm not an English professor. <laughs> so I, I often feel under-equipped to yeah, do can so. I say, Can I just say, writing teaching is not, has not ever been and should not be the sole province of English professors. Writing teaching is something that you know, English professors had better know how to do it, but it happens everywhere. My, my first and most important writing teacher was my mother. Noted. I absolutely feel like I have a role in helping graduate students write, but I have often felt like I came up short with how to give them practical tools to write better. And that is where your book delivers with very practical tools. This is what clear writing looks like. Hey, I'm not just going to tell you about it. Let me give you an example. Here's a paragraph. And then let me tell you what I did. And here is the same paragraph. Do you see, dear reader, <laughs> how moving from passive voice to active voice, how removing jargons, how removing unnecessary quotes, simplifies and therefore clarifies the writing. And I think one of the pieces of advice I would give a lot was something like, can you make this more simple? You know, scholarly writing shouldn't be difficult to read, but I didn't necessarily have examples or tools to say, and this is how you do that. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about clarity and simplicity, because especially for this audience, sometimes I see maybe a predisposition to go to the other extreme of using big words and complicated phrases because it might make them look smart. 
Yeah, so let's talk about motivation here first. If your goal is to have people respect and fear you, then um, using a lot, a lot of obscure jargon is a way of pushing them out of your circle in the hope that they will want to be in that circle again and or at least will admire you for being in it when they're not. This works particularly when uh, writers who have a certain status as experts in a field are talking to people who may have less expertise. But this is also an example of using expertise as a bludgeon instead of as an aid to try to bring people along with you. So one of the commandments that I'll try to pass on in this book is to be a generous expert. If you're writing about something, it means you know something about it and you want to communicate that something, whatever it is. If you want to communicate it, then you have to adopt a generous point of view. If, on the other hand, you harbor a secret fear that if people understand you, they're going to say, oh, you're not that smart. Or worse, you're not that smart, so I'm not going to accept your writing for publication or I'm not going to promote you in your job whether it be an academic job or something else, well, then your motivations become quite mixed. They don't necessarily become a motivation to communicate. They instead are a motivation to be admired. But what I want to suggest is that writers who succeed in communicating complex ideas are the ones who are most admirable. And in fact, the ones who in the long run are most admired. So communication is itself admirable. Not, not all academic writing is going, is going to, in its best form, be equally simple. But all academic writing should be as clear as it can be so that it can reach its own widest possible audience. If I'm writing about algebraic geometry, if I'm a, a mathematician writing about algebraic geometry, you know, I'm not going to be able to reach a high school student who may not even have taken geometry or maybe not even algebra. But if I'm writing about algebraic geometry for some audience of mathematicians, that audience can be larger or smaller based on how I do my job. How, uh, how am I going to reach out? How am I going to think about what is it that my reader needs? This book is not written just for so-called English students. It's written for everybody across the arts and sciences who are trying to write with some kind of seriousness of purpose. And yes, I did try to write it conversationally, and I tried to write it so that it, uh, it can communicate its most important ideas in as efficient and clear a way as possible. But I also tried to write it so that it can communicate in a personal way. I hope that if you read this book, you get a sense that the writer is talking to you because that's how I wrote, that's how I wrote it. It's a very, it's a personal book in this way. And the best compliment, you know, this book has, has comes out officially at the, we're talking just before it's going to come out officially. Uh, this podcast will appear just after it comes out officially. So, um, I haven't heard too much because, uh, the, um, the book hasn't shipped yet, but among those who read it in advance, one of the nicest compliments I received was from someone who said, you're on every page of this. And I thought, well, okay, then I did something right because I wanted this not simply to be a set of commands or the kind of advice that, uh, that Google would deliver, you know, or a YouTube video might deliver. I wanted it to be a person talking to another person. And if I've succeeded in that, then I hope that um, the book offers some advice along with some warmth, along with also a reason why this matters. Because as I said, this is not just about one writer. That academic writing needs to be a public good in the aggregate just as higher education needs to be a public good and the one is connected to the other. And so when, when we write, particularly from within a college or university setting, 
we're making an argument for a public that the education is a public good. When we write poorly or in a way that alienates a reader, makes a reader feel that the writer is being unfriendly, saying, I don't care about you. I don't want you to understand this. Then we are breaking down relationships that as, as a society we need to have. And this book is also about that. It's not just a how-to book. You know, before I read your book, Lynn, I may have said something like this. My English professor impacted me. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to say my English professor changed the way that I wrote by caring about be- me enough to sit me down and say, Heather, you've got some great ideas. But unless you take time to learn how to articulate them in a way that will meet people where they are and that will engage with people, your ideas are just really just going to sit here and do nothing. And isn't that why you're here? And everyone who's listening to this podcast, faculty or students, nine times out of 10, you're here because you believe you're part of a solution to some bigger problem. And it's a heartbreak to think that all the time and energy you're putting into something is just going to sit on a shelf somewhere and not be enacted, not make the change that you want to. And that definitely came through in your book, that call at the end to be part of this change. You're in the institution of education and education is here for a higher good. Please be part of the solution and care enough about your reader. You say in there, don't be mean to your reader, though. care about them. And I also want to say, I, I loved reading this book. I'm sure I have listeners out there that are thinking, I do not have time to read another book because most of what they're reading, they have to slog through. Like you said, right? It's a painful process. And oh my gosh, a, a book about writing, how interesting can that be? But I'm here to say, I read it in a weekend. Yes, I spent most of that weekend in my pajamas, but <laughs> was a, I'm getting over a cold, so I had a good excuse. But this was a journey, Lynn, where I didn't just learn how to think about writing in a different way and and picked up some very practical tips I can give my students, one of which I want to share here because I want everyone to hear this. But you had me stopping off to hang out with Steve Martin in Orwell. It was an unexpected, incredibly pleasurable journey. If I read a book and I learn something, I call that a win. But this was definitely, as my daughters would say, a two thumbs up because I learned something and I had fun while I was doing it. So kudos to you because I think that that is a talent that not everyone has. Thank you. It's what I was trying to do. So it's exceptionally gratifying to hear that from a thoughtful reader like you. Now, the tip I want everyone to hear, I'm hoping that everyone gets this book, but in the interest of making an impact in the next couple of weeks, when this goes live, a tip I had not ever heard before, and it relates to this storytelling, is to take your topic sentence of each paragraph, just the topic sentence, and string those together and see if it tells a story. Yeah, I like that one very much. It's a way of telling whether you're signposting your story properly, whether your story coheres, and whether it is something that you are breaking up into the kinds of chunks that are going to be easily digested by by your reader. Now, I I got a lot of tips from a lot of different people. The majority of them are from myself because uh, I've been teaching this stuff for many years. And uh, decades ago, I started taking notes for this book. There is no book that I have that I've written and I've written or edited a whole bunch of them that has been in my workshop for longer than this. And given my current age, I'm quite certain that there's never going to be one that exceeds it. So, uh, this, this is the, uh, the product of long marination. And a lot of those tips are, um, hard won bits of advice that I learned how to formulate through encountering the need in the classroom or in a, in the kind of informal gatherings of my graduate students. That my, my graduate teaching motivated this book at least as much as my undergraduate teaching, prob- probably more. 
because I would work with my graduate students over longer periods of time. We'd be visiting the same piece of writing over time. We'd have a chance to talk about not just the writing, but also the development of each of the student as a writer. So I'm grateful to all of my dissertation students, there have been dozens, for their own large and small contributions to my own thought process, because it has been a collaboration all along of, of a certain kind. I, I truly hope everyone gets this book. You will not be sorry. But before we wrap up this episode, you know, in my experience, learning how to write and learning how to find your academic voice is really something that is challenging to many people. So do you have maybe a favorite quote or some final words of wisdom to send off with the audience? Yes, I will I will offer the beginning of the book, which is the one of the first tips that I started giving writers who were writing for me as an audience. That ac academic writing, unlike many practices, has a primal scene. You know, like uh, Adam and Eve or something. The uh, that uh, the primal scene of academic writing, its origin story, if you will. The primal scene of academic writing is some student writing some paper for some teacher somewhere. Often, the first time this happens is in middle school. Um, maybe later, maybe sooner, and of course, this scene is repeated for many iterations, and that's how writers are socialized into the business of writing for an audience that um, we learn how to do it in that particular kind of classroom setting. And we learn how to do it by repeating that. So what's distinctive about that setting? Uh, I think its most distinctive feature is one which is almost never discussed, which is that the reader in this scenario is getting paid. The teacher is getting paid for their attention to the student's writing. And therefore, the student realizes without ever being told, you don't ever have to worry about losing the attention of this reader because it's been bought and paid for before they start. They're going to give you some kind of attentive reading no matter what. Now, that's a really bad habit of mind to pick up, this idea that I don't need to pay attention to the needs of the reader because the reader is going to read me anyway. Now, it is true that if we flash forward, you know, a couple decades or something, you're me and you're reading to teach that class the next day, and you know you have to read this article, wh wh whether it's well or poorly written, because it's, it's necessary for me to prepare that class the next day. But that writer, if that writer forgot that I'm on the other end and that I have needs, then that writer is simply repeating that primal scene one more time. The best tip that I can offer a writer in a general sense is try to remember that even though the reader is being paid, that doesn't mean that the reader doesn't have needs. And in fact, many readers aren't being paid. So it's best to write as though the reader is not being paid and to try to earn that reader's attention through the, the kind of attention that you give to the reader's wants and needs as well as you can infer them. So the, whether the reader is being paid or not, write as though they weren't. And I think all the listeners will say, yes, of course, I want to do that, but how? And I'm going to turn them to your book. I've got the link in the show notes because, again, it's full of the practical tips and examples so that you can up your writing. I'm looking forward right now. I'm working on a writing project and I'm looking forward to putting these into place. So Lynn, thank you so much for coming out and hanging out with me on the show. Uh, it's music to my ears. They, uh, good luck on your writing and thanks as ever for having me. And uh, let's, let's do it again sometime. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Until then, if you're looking for more ways to invite joy in your journey, check out the free resources at expandyourhappy.com. You'll find downloads like an article I wrote titled, The Doctoral Journey, 12 Things You Need to Know That They Probably Won't Tell You. 
You'll also find a PDF that organizes all podcasts by the seven steps detailed in the Happy Doc Student Handbook, which you can also find on the website. Finally, if you're looking for a Happy Doc Student swag, I've got that too. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and YouTube channel. And if you want to make my day, rate and review so that together we can change the way doctoral education is delivered and experienced. Hey, one more thing, just a quick reminder that the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only.